the backcountry. It conjures up images of western mountains. But I've come to realize that the backcountry can be wherever you find it. From the swamps of Florida to the mountains of Montana and everywhere in between. Each of these areas have their own backcountry. And each of these areas have their own heritage and history. Join me as I set out to explore these areas, learning about the animals, the history of the area, the people, and what makes each of them special. I do things my way. I do things the old way, while at the same time taking advantage of modern advancements in weapons, optics, and gear. I am independent. I am patient. I'm focused on the history, tradition, and heritage of the areas that I hunt. I am the last of a generation of hunters who did things their way. I am the last of a breed. You know, I'm a glutton for punishment. It's not like one day I just woke up and said, hey, I want to be a mountain man. <laughs> I was born into it. I didn't really have a choice. I'm glad I didn't, but I don't know anything else. You know, so when I was a kid, my uncle, he had this idea that all of us kids should know survival techniques. And we weren't very old. Took us out, had us eating grubs, had us <laughs> building their own shelters, you know, doing that whole deal. And, you know, one of his favorite movies was Red Dawn. And he always thought, well, you know, that's stuff you need to know if the Russians ever come in. <laughs> uh, you know, I tried to follow in his footsteps as much as I could because he was the one that got me into traditional hunting. He was the one that, you know, the mountain man lifestyle really hit home with him. All right, I can tell by the look on your face that you think maybe I'm just a few cards shy of a full deck up here, huh? He was a traditional archer and he loved doing things the hard way. My love and my desire to do what I do started with him. It was his way of life. You know, they called him the mountain rat. I'm just a little bigger and uglier and they had to call me Sasquatch, so. I was a kid, my dad, <laughs> I think I was eight years old, he bought me a 1022, and he told me that he would buy me one brick of 22 shells. And he said that my job was prairie dog eradication. And for every prairie dog tail I brought him, he would give me a nickel. You know, that was my job of how I paid for my ammunition as a kid. I learned really quick to be selective in the shots that I take, because with an open sight 22, you know, I had, I had a few of the first prairie dogs get down the hole and I was out of nickel. That was one round I'd never get back. So it taught me a lot of things and that's where, you know, I do a lot of open sight hunting nowadays. It's natural to me. I've been doing it since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Well, I don't know if I was ever that small, but. And one thing a lot of people don't know about me or my history is the fact that my uncles started filming long before I was ever even around. Uh, my uncle Dirk, he owned an outfitting business and his younger brother Colt worked for him. And they started filming their hunts mainly elk, mule deer, bear, mountain lion. And he produced VHS tapes and sold them in Walmart back in the 70s and 80s, long time ago. Half of you kids probably don't even know what a VHS is. Well, hello everybody, glad you could join us. Now I'm Dirk Ross, and I got some of my camera in here. This is Chris Dean, that's my brother Colt over there, and this is my son Talon. And with a few others, we produce the Mountain Man videos. And so, I'm not doing something unknown to my family. I'm just following a family tradition and in my uncle's footsteps.
you know, honestly, there's not much has really changed. Film quality may be a little different, but the values and the hunting aspects are still the same. And because of how I was raised, the Colorado mountains will always feel like home. prime example of why you need predator control. I can see four bears from right where I'm sitting, but I haven't seen an elk or a deer yet. Bears are pretty solitary animals and they stay in the timber quite a bit. And the fact that you're seeing that many bears in an area like this, where it should be covered up with deer and elk, bears kill more fawns and calves than any other animal out there, including wolves, mountain lions, everything. They, they hurt the population of the elk and deer more than any other animal. And you have to manage them just like anything else. You take Colorado, for example, they're having bear problems all over the place. There's bears all over in town. We're up here at 11,000 feet. I'm seeing four bears this first morning. <laughs> I like seeing bears as much as anybody, but I also like to eat elk and deer, see a balance of all the animals. You know, we owe it to all the critters to manage the wildlife. But just because it's management doesn't mean it can't be fun. I mean, spring bear hunting is one of my favorite things to do. Into May, this is about the best time to find a big, big boar. I mean, you could see a big bear just about anywhere. You know, they'll lock up with the sow and they may be with her for a day, two days, three days, breeding her, and then he'll go about his business and go find another one. Kind of scandalous if you ask me, but... Survival of the fittest, I guess. smacked him. I hammered him good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that happened quick. I'm sitting here just watching this hillside. Out of nowhere, here come that sow. And then I see the big boar. Oh, this is awesome. <clears throat> I love it. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Man, that right there is a tank of a bear. Look, old warrior, you look, his teeth are all broken off and worn down. Heck, he's missing that one. That is a dandy, dandy bear. I mean, he's a monster. This might be the biggest black bear I've ever killed in my life. Look at the skull on that thing. Man, look at the size of those paws. Just to show you how big this bear is. Remember, I'm 6'6". Six, six. Oh. It's a big bear. <laughs> kind of funny, my grandpa used to guide hunters and whatnot. And he'd always tell the hunters that this right here, that's the bad meat. You might as well just give that meat to him or leave it there or something, because it ain't worth a dang. <laughs> it's a backstrap. That's what your tenderloin steaks and stuff like that are made of. Grandpa, he's a he's a sly one. <laughs> I couldn't be more thankful. This old bear. This is the kind of bear you want to take. I'm thankful he's gonna provide me with some food, some bear fat, a nice hide. I'm gonna use every bit of this bear. It won't anything go to waste. And that's how it should be. <laughs>